Welcome members and regulars, welcome visitors to our online services week by week. And week by week, we are so privileged and honoured to hear God's word and God speaks his word to us about his son. And in hearing about Jesus, we find true hope and true life. And so we begin by listening to God's word. And today, we're starting a series on Revelation. And to understand Revelation, there are key passages in the Old Testament that we need to hear. And one of those key passages is in Daniel chapter 7, verse 13 to 14. Let's listen to God's word. In my vision that night, I looked, and there before me was one like a son of man, coming with the clouds of heaven. He approached the Ancient of Days and was led into his presence. He was given authority and glory and sovereign power. All nations and peoples of every language worshipped him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion and will not pass away, and his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. When Jesus came, sent by God, one of the most common references to himself was this title called the Son of Man. The Son of Man is that final figure that God will send to give eternal authority, glory and power, and every nation will acknowledge Let's turn to God in prayer. Almighty God, we come before you, and as we approach you, may we know that you are a holy God, and that we as sinners and fallen beings have no right to know you, to approach you, let alone worship you. But we thank you that in your mercy, in your grace, in your unchanging love, given, poured out, in the precious work of your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, on the cross, you have made the worship of you, the true and living God, possible. So grace us by your word, grace us by your spirit, that we might come to know you by bowing the knee to Jesus Christ, the Son of Man, the Son of God. In his mighty name we pray. Amen. Whenever we gather as God's people, there are a few things that we do in obedience to God and in praising of God and glory of Him. And one is that we sing praises to Him. And the singing praises to God is an expression of the giving of our lives now that our lives had been atoned, purchased. We are washed clean and made the people of God. And today we are very blessed to have our youth ministry, which we call BASIC, the brothers and sisters in Christ, lead us in our worship in song. Over to Janice and BASIC. Hi Church, my name is Janice and today I'll be leading us in songs together with the musicians and singers from the Basic Youth Ministry. The first song that we'll be singing is Chorus of the Saved. And this song always reminds me of the spiritual blessings and the riches of God's grace that we have in Christ. When we look at the state of our sinful world and our sinful hearts, there's no reason to rejoice. But we can have true joy and sing praise only because of Christ Jesus, who has entered into our lives and saved us. We hope that you will join the Chorus of the Saved by singing along with us wherever you are. God risen Son, all the angels rejoice at His name, all creation sustained by the power of His word, and His throne will endure for now and Son sacrificed once for all. Power of sin, fear of death, now destroyed. Raised to life, raised on high, Jesus' name above all names. His acclaim will resound beyond the Who 
His blood our forgiveness is sure. By His Spirit within will endure. Holding on to this hope as an anchor for our soul. And our eyes fixed on Jesus, the one who saves us. Come join the song in earth and heaven puts His praise with the chorus of the saints. full of faith, our lips full of praise. So let us draw near the holiest place. Now pure through His blood, our sins washed away. Now let us draw near the holiest place. Our hearts full of faith, our lips full of praise. So let us draw near the holiest place. Now pure through His blood, our sins washed away. Come join the song in earth and heaven voices raise with the chorus of the saved. Come shout His name, come lift a sacrifice of praise with the chorus of the saved. found salvation in Christ, Romans 8 verse 38 to 39 says that neither death nor life, nor angels nor rulers, nor things present nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Our lives are hidden with our Saviour who is seated before the throne of God above. my 
Savior and my God. Thank you so much, Janice, and our basic, our youth, for leading us in two songs that affirm and assure us that Jesus Christ is Lord, that Jesus Christ is the one pleading for us to be holy and blameless, that Jesus Christ is God's servant sent to save the world. We come now to what we call the reading of God's Word. And so in our churches here, we read responsively. And uh, if you can read responsively, as this passage is being read by our sister Geraldine Tam, who is training in ministry, The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show to his servants the things that must soon take place. He made it known by sending his angel to his servant John, who bore witness to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ, even to all that he saw. Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy, and blessed are those who hear and who keep what is written in it, for the time is near. John to the seven churches that are in Asia. Praise to you and peace from him, who is, and who was, and who is to come, and from the seven spirits who are before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, and the ruler of kings on earth, to him who loves us, and has freed us from our sins by his blood, and made us a kingdom, priests to his God and Father. To him be glory and dominion for ever and ever. Amen. Behold, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him, and all the tribes of the earth will will on account of him. Even so. Amen. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is, and who was, and who is to come, the Almighty. Thank you so much, Geraldine. This is the Word of God, and it's the Word of God that brings truth and comfort and life into our hearts and into our world. We come now to the financial giving. The financial giving is the response, a small expression of giving of our lives to God. As it says in Romans chapter 12, we are to, in view of God's mercies, we are to offer our bodies as a living sacrifice. And so, this is the joy and the commitment of our members and our regulars. If you're new with us, uh, don't feel obliged to give. And you can give in various ways, as you can see in the e-bulletin and also in the QR code that's there. We come now to the announcements. And the announcements have to do with the things that we embark on ministries that we do. And so, last week we said in the pastoral letter that at the heart of God's people, we have a calling to love God by loving His Son, exalting His Son. So we love Christ by loving His Word. And we are now beginning in June, a short series on the book of Revelation. We're going to cover the first seven, eight chapters. And here is how it, it might look for us in the month of June. We're going to try a new thing, usually in June, we have the church camp and we're going to have a virtual church camp and it's going to be revolving around chapters 2, 3 and 4. And so please take note of that and how to be part of this. We're starting today, Revelation chapter 1, an introduction to this book and the main themes therein. And then the virtual church camp will take place next week, beginning on a Friday at 8pm and then on Saturday and Sunday. The next slide. So please take note that on Friday, it begins at 8 p.m., Revelation 2, and there'll be a combination of testimonies and songs as we listen to God's Word. Then on Saturday, to try and capture the spirit of a church camp, we're going to have uh, immediately after the session of testimonies and song and the preaching of God's Word on Revelation 3, we're going to have small groups where we're going to break up into small groups to share our lives and to pray together, to give thanks to God because testifying to the goodness of God, the goodness of Jesus in our lives is so important. And so we as the pastors, as the elders and the deacons look forward to being with you and the discipleship groups being with you in this small group's time. 
To sign up for the small groups, you, re you have to get on to our next link. Please register at ARPC at ARPC Virtual Camp. The Sunday sessions will be streamed as our normal times and you can still access that through our ARPC website. I hope it's all clear because we don't want anything to derail us from what we do each year, each day under God. And so the Virtual Church Camp, come and join us to be blessed as we continue to listen to God's Word in this book. Next announcement has to do with what we launched last week, that in the light of uh, COVID-19 all around the world and the economic repercussions, there'll be more people losing jobs, there'll be people facing financial challenges and hardship. We, as God's people, the church, have launched an Essential Relief Fund, or ERF in short, and it is for people in our midst, our members and our regulars, who are facing hardship due to this, and it's to complement the four different budgets that our government has put up, and some people may not meet the criteria and maybe fall into the cracks. And as God's church, we want to have no one in need, especially in terms of putting food on the table. So, please feel free to speak to the pastors, your discipleship group leaders and the ministry leaders to apply and they'll point you to the uh, application form and the right link for it. May God grace you to share because as God's people, that's what love is in practical care for one another. The next announcement has to do with in the light of all the present fears that we have, all our concerns and anxieties and preoccupations of the future. We're going to have an ask session, asking, seeking and knocking. And so I'll be attempting to answer as many questions as we shepherd our members and our regulars in discipleship groups. And a good number have already signed up. Please take note, we need you to register for this, as we have told you, and on our Facebook and online uh, platforms. And so please sign up and join us Saturday at 8pm. Last but not least, our ministries continue and one way in which we share the good news of Jesus is through our culinary arts ministry and on June 14, next week, we're going to learn how to make dreamy durian puffs. So come along and sweeten your life firstly with these dreamy durian puffs and then sweeten your life by hearing the good news of Jesus Christ. So we pray that you take part in our ministries and though our ministries are online, there's still the substance of ministering God's word and God's love to us. We come now to a time of prayer and we're going to pray for all, always from the global to the national to our personal life. And the global scene, our hearts and our concerns must go to the nation of America that in the aftermath and the throes of the very tragic death of George, George Floyd that uh, we are to pray for the racial tensions that's rocking that nation. And then we're going to pray for the China-US relationships that will affect the rest of the world. We continue to pray for ourselves as we embark on the three phases of reopening as a safe nation. And then finally, we're going to pray for ourselves. Come, let's go to the one who, who loves us, the one who created us, the one who cares for us, Let's go to God in prayer. May we always humble ourselves before you and pause long enough that you are our wise creator, that you created all things in heaven and on earth for the glorious purpose that they will put under the lordship of Jesus. Though we may not understand the full meaning and mystery of that, we want to humbly believe that you had a good purpose in creating us and a glorious purpose in redeeming us through the sacrifice of your Son. That left to ourselves, the world that we live in will be filled with sin and sickness and finally death and finally judgment. But because of your grace and your mercy and your love, we are given a new beginning so we thank you with all our hearts for Jesus, our Saviour, our Lord, the way, the truth, the life, the Good Shepherd. And we pray that in, in calling out to the person in the name of the Lord Jesus, we would find salvation, we would find wisdom, we would find everything that we need to live a life that is pleasing to you 
as we complete your mission. Father, we pray for your truth to overwhelm the half-truths in the nation of America. In the aftermath of this very tragic death of George Floyd at the hands of a police officer, we pray, Father, that this will be a moment to turn the tide in the very sad history of the racial relationships between blacks and whites there. And we pray, Father, for your church to rise to the occasion, to think beyond politics and to read your word and to hear your voice and to know that Jesus is the ultimate peacemaker who has come to break down every barrier that we so easily erect, racial barriers, cultural barriers that we erect to find superiority in ourselves and the, and the discrimination of others. And so we pray that in hearing the gospel and believing in Jesus, we would have the answer to all that goes wrong in our life. We pray for the leaders, beginning with President Trump, and we pray for the leaders of the parties. We pray for the local leaders, that there will be such a sense of your truth and sense of oneness and sense of harmony that will overwhelm and instead reject and reject the forces of evil, of hatred, of discord. We pray. We continue to pray for the tensions between America and China, knowing that we are facing a change of, of superpowers. But your word tells us that the rise and fall of nations, the coming and going of empires, is all in your hands to serve your glorious purpose of salvation. So we pray that every leader, every government, would know that they are put in temporal power and they will all be accountable to you. We pray that no one will allow this to go to their hearts and their heads and bring turmoil and discord into our world. We continue to pray that it's the preaching of the gospel and believing in Jesus that will bring true salvation and true peace in our world. Last but not least, we pray for ourselves, we pray for our nation, we pray for our leaders, we pray for our cabinet, we pray that as we carefully reopen the country and economy, balancing the health concerns and the economic financial concerns, that you grant us prudence, you grant us wisdom, for there are so many different voices as to how to do this. And we pray that there be such a sense of unity amongst us as Singaporeans and residents of how best to do this. And we continue to pray for our guest workers and their needs and the new thinking that must go to loving them, welcoming them, providing for their accommodation and their well-being as they help us build our country. And the new thinking and the new ways of relating between ourselves as we look to you and trust you to love us and provide for us through all times. In all ways, we pray for us as your children to rise up to your high calling to be a beacon of light and hope as we proclaim the gospel and exalt Jesus. In his mighty name we pray. Amen. Amen. We come now to the scripture reading and we continue with reading Revelation 1 and our sister Karen Liu who leads up our children's church work for the primary sector, will be reading God's word for us. Revelation verses 9 to 20. I, John, your brother and partner in the tribulation and the kingdom and the patient endurance that are in Jesus, was on the island called Patmos on account of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. I was in the spirit on the Lord's day and I heard behind me a loud voice, like a trumpet, saying, Write what you see in a book, and send it to the seven churches, to Ephesus, and to Smyrna, and to Pergamum, and to Tyratia, and to Sardis, and to Philadelphia, and to Laodicea. Then I turned to see the voice that was speaking to me, and on turning, I saw seven golden lampstands, and in the midst of the lampstands, 
one like a son of man, clothed with a long robe and with a golden sash around his chest. The hairs of his head were white, like white wool, like snow. His eyes were like a flame of fire. His feet were like burnished bronze, refined in a furnace, and his voice was like the roar of many waters. In his right hand, he held seven stars. From his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword, and his face was like the sun, shining in full strength. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. But he laid his right hand on me, saying, Fear not, I am the first and the last and the living one. I died, and behold, I am alive forevermore, and I have the keys of death and Hades. Write therefore the things that you have seen, those that are and those that are to take place after this. As for the mystery of the seven stars that you saw in my right hand, and the seven golden lampstands, the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. Thank you so much, Sister Karen. This is the Word of God. And all around as we listen to this, wherever we are, we must say increasingly, this is the Word of God. We begin our time on this series in Revelation by exploring the theme of absence. Absence of someone or something means different things to different people at different times. And so because of uh, what's happening around the world and the circuit breaker, so many of our dating couples, courting couples, who are intending to marry this year, cannot meet up. So we are running marriage preparation classes or ma marriage preparation courses for them uh, virtually. And sometimes when I meet the couples virtually, the first thing I ask them is, do you miss each other? How much do you miss each other? And they quickly, beginning with the guys, must say, yes, I miss you, miss you tremendously or else they'll be in trouble. So absence does mean different things to different people at different times. It all began with the soft crying, the sound of soft crying. And two Bangladeshi guest workers here were going on their rounds in Bado, one of the suburbs here, picking up uh, garbage and refuse. As they heard this cry, one of them thought they misheard and so asked his partner sitting in that uh, vehicle going around to pick up the rubbish. And he said he also heard it. But sometimes they, they say, yeah, people throw toys and sometimes they throw uh, baby dolls with these batteries in it. And so they stopped the buggy to check. And as they checked, they found a Sheng Siong supermarket plastic bag over, over this. So they stepped in, they reached out for the bag. And what did they find? They found a naked baby lying in a small pool of water with blood on his body. Part of the baby's umbilical cord was still attached. To their horrors, they found a baby abandoned and thrown down the rubbish chute from a high-rise uh, building. And so the supervisor immediately called the police and then one of the guest workers, Mr. Patwari, he ran to the bin centre, he grabbed a piece of cloth and then cleaned the baby and wrapped the baby. Baby discarded, Born, discarded, thrown down a chute, a rubbish chute. Unthinkable. But it happens ever so often in our world. And that took my mind right back to the time when I was in Calcutta in India. And on one of the free days, um, this friend and this guide brought us along to see the famous Ganges River, the longest river in, in India, 2,500 kilometres and each year during the major festivals, thousands, indeed millions of people will throng them. And then the guide told us a story that really struck me that I've never forgotten. That in some of these festivals where thousands throng the banks of the river during a festival, the desperate and the poor take the occasion to do what? To bring their babies, unwanted babies, to bring their sick relatives that they cannot care for, 
and sometimes to bring their aged parents that they have no financial ability to care for and leave them there among the crowd to be abandoned and hopefully to be picked up by someone else. As I heard that, my mind went back to my mum, who at the time was still alive and living with me and she was in her 90s. Imagine telling mum, I'm bringing you to a festival at this place. And then at the very festival, we lay her down to sit and it's crowded with people all around and then we leave her there, never to see her again. Of course, people living in poverty and desperation sometimes are forced to do that. For people in such circumstances, absence of a baby, absence of a loved one, absence of a sick relative, absence of an aged parent may be the solution to the unbearable burdens and responsibilities, the unbearable pain and our fate in life. In many religions, they consider that as fate. So absence for some people is the solution. But for others, absence is not the solution, it's not the cure, it's not the remedy. Absence is the very problem and the very crisis. When we come to Revelation, the absence of Jesus with his earthly church presents to us a crisis of faith. And so the meaning of absence, again, for some, absence is the solution, especially for those in dire straits, unable to look after an a child born out of wedlock, unable to look after a sick uh, relative or an aged parent. But for us who believe in Christ, the absence of Jesus becomes our crisis of faith. Indeed, Jesus in his earthly life and ministry kept warning his inner circle of disciples that he would soon depart, he would soon leave them. And of course, they couldn't understand this. What does he mean by this? As he referred to his death, his resurrection and ascension, his temporary leaving of them. And what must they and we, as followers of Jesus, do? And so, when we read the book of Revelation, this is the heart of the matter. It explains the apparent physical absence of Jesus from his people, from their pain, from our pain, from our problems. And in the face of increasing persecution, that the Christians face in the first century, their deepening angst and anxiety, their growing cries would be, why has Jesus abandoned us? Why has Jesus left us? With that as the backdrop, we can read the passage, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show to his servants the thing that must soon take place. He made it known by sending his angel to his servant John, who bore witness to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ, even to all he saw. Blessed, blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy, and blessed are those who hear this prophecy, and blessed are those who keep what is written in it, for the time is near. The loud message of this last book of the Bible is the word of God to us. It both corrects and comforts us. And the corrective and the comfort simultaneously is Jesus did not leave us and leave us behind. Jesus did not abandon us, his people, his beloved church. Jesus did not forget and forsake us. Indeed, Jesus has done the very opposite. The risen Jesus, the ascended Jesus, now as throne and thrown as King of Kings and Lord of Lords, receiving all authority from God, He is now unveiling and revealing and disclosing the true picture, the true circumstances. Notice the source of this revelation, which means unveiling, the source of this final drawing back of the curtains, the sequence of it is from God to Jesus, through the angel, to John, to the church, and to the church, and through the church, to the world. 
And so we notice both then and now, this revelation is of hidden realities. And what on earth is, are hidden realities? Hidden realities is the unseen world of spiritual warfare. You mean there's an unseen world? Yes. When we draw back the curtains of heaven, we see the unseen world, and the unseen world is there is a, a battle between God and Satan over us. And God tells us in His Word that He has finally won this war by the gift of Jesus coming to suffer and to die on the cross, to take God's wrath for us, absorb God's wrath, to forgive us of sin and to make us the people of God. But after saying that, if revelation means, the word means, the unveiling, the disclosure, the drawing back of the curtains to see the hidden realities, for us as modern day people with a scientific mind, right, and the scientific mind always needs things to be tested, tested, before it becomes, uh, before it turns from hypothesis into a theory, into fact. And so this is where the problem is. We think that the unseen means it is unreal. We often think that the unseen means the unreal, the unbelievable. And so we know in America, which is now in turmoil in so many ways, and so there is a big group, a big push who really don't think that this COVID-19 is so serious. And so they have been protesting for the economy to open. State by state and different states are different. And this is the story of Lauren Leander, who is a nurse in the ICU in Arizona. She decided in the light of this increasing protest on the streets, just the, the angry protesters asking for the reopening of the economy, that this COVID-19 is not as dangerous as it is. She decided to put on her uniform and decided to stand there and to face the shouts and the taunts and the insults and the shaming by these pro protesters who shouted in her face and all those in uniform that they are liars. And she said after that, liar, me a liar, me, a nurse working in ICU, a liar. Seeing a human being passing away and saying farewell to their loved ones via FaceTime because their, their family cannot go to visit them in hospital is the most heartbreaking thing you will ever see. So for her, Lauren Leander, unseen is not unreal. This is a highly infectious and de deadly virus. And it's, it's waging a war against our health. It's a real virus killing real people in real time. And so for her, working in ICU day in, day out, unseen is actually the real. Is that you? Is that me as you live our life? That God is unseen and Jesus is unseen and so He's unreal to you and me. And having faith in this God who created us, having faith in this Jesus who has saved us and redeemed us is totally unreal, especially as the world faces so many problems. This vision that has come from God, from Jesus, through the angel, to John, and John to his people, to God's people, the church, and through the church to the world is totally real. Please take note that the source of the revelation is Jesus and the content of the revelation is Jesus. So it's Jesus, Jesus everywhere. And notice the word that is used. Blessed are those who read this word aloud, this prophecy aloud. Blessed are those who hear this word and the hearing of God's word is a major theme that we're going to look at in chapters 2 and 3. He who has ears, let him hear. He who has ears, let him hear. But finally, the one who keeps this word, which means takes this prophecy, this final prophecy to heart, which we've been saying and teaching, that I've been saying and teaching, that hearing in the Bible, hearing for us from God's perspective, is not a year activity. Hearing is always a heart activity. God speaks, we must listen. He speaks, we must keep His word. That is the definition of hearing. That is the definition of us being true believers and true followers. 
I am now, by God's grace, a hearer and a keeper of His Word. I am now a man and woman under instruction, which tells you, before you came to know God, before you came to know Jesus, you and me were people living with no instruction, under no rule. We were lawless people. And so, how is your hearing from the heart? Have you, have, have you had a teachable heart moment? And so, we have just read this week of a Singaporean student studying in the UK. And studying in the UK, he heard from his relatives and his friends here in Singapore and started to take the precautions way before the UK started to get serious about this because the government spent some time a bit slow behind the curve in, in waking up to the dangers of COVID-19. And so the student right, uh, kept in touch with his family and so he took the precautions, he wore the mask. In fact, he went further, he wore gloves and wherever he went, whatever he touched, he would go back and he would wore the gloves, he would go back, he would wash his hands, wash his hands very often. But then, almost towards the end of his stay before he returned home, he was invited to a party by his friend to celebrate a win, if not wrong, a table tennis win, a win in university in something. And so he said, I'm coming home already. So he went. And as he reflected on that decision to go to that party, he went and then in all likelihood, he was infected with COVID-19 at that party. As he reflected on it, he said he had been so careful up to that point, right? but he let his gut down. He was still receiving the news from his parents, from his, from his relatives, from his friends in Singapore. He was still listening to the news, but he no longer for that night kept it in his heart. And the repercussions of him letting his gut down and not hearing from his heart was 68 days in isolation ward in a hospital here after he returned and 22 swaps to see whether he had recovered from it. 68 days. In total, he was separated from his family for eight months. And especially the last, the last two months was because of his own folly of not keeping a very precious word in his heart. I ask in hearing that, how is your hearing? You hearing with your ears or are you hearing with your heart? How is your keeping of God's word fulfilled in the person and work of Jesus? And so this revelation, this unveiling is all about the person and work of Jesus. You listening to him? As we mentioned Jesus again, oh no, are you saying in your heart, oh no, it's Jesus again? If you are listening and you are graced by God, you should say, oh yes, it is about the great Lord Jesus again. Our life, and we had uh, two weeks ago, Colin Buchanan and our brother sing a song for us, led us in our services, in our services, and he sang a song called Real Hope. And one of the lyrics, the punchline is, we can bet our life on Jesus. This revelation, this unveiling, this drawing back of the curtains is to show us the source of this revelation is Jesus. The content of it is Jesus Christ. And it is to bet our life on Him. Is that you? Is that me? If you're not staking your life and making your decisions and taking your actions with Jesus at the centre of things, then perhaps you are hearing superficially and not keeping God's word in your heart. And then it moves on. John to the seven churches that are in Asia. Grace to you and peace from him who is, who was, who is to come. And from the seven spirits who before his throne and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from among the dead, and the ruler of the kings of, on earth. And so seven is a number of completion. To the seven churches, the seven churches are named and we're going to get to know them when we do Revelation 2 and 3 next week when you tune in. 
and there are seven real churches then when it was written, and also seven churches that rep represent God's people in all places at all times. So as we open up Revelation and read it, it is still God's revelation to us about His Son, Jesus Christ. And the things to take note. The seven spirits refer to God's Holy Spirit dwelling among His people at, in all places at all times. And now, this unveiling, this drawing back of the curse, and this, this, this disclosing the unseen Israel, who Jesus is, and once we know who Jesus is, how to put faith, how to bet our life and stick our life on who He is. So when you read these 22 chapters of Revelation, John sees from God. He sees and writes to God's people, the church spread all over Asia Minor. And he sees God's people increasingly experiencing what? He sees God's people, the church, encircled by enemies, surrounded by enemies, pressured, choke. And you listen to that language. He sees in the light of them living in the Roman em Empire with increasing opposition and persecution. They are encircled, surrounded, pressured, choked. The church was in the midst of a hostile and angry world in the Roman Empire. And the message of God and Jesus is that yes, the church, is surrounded and circled, increasingly pressured and choked. But in the midst of the church is Jesus Christ, giving life to us and offering eternal life to a church that can't breathe, increasingly cannot breathe because of the pressure of persecution on believers to give up on Jesus. So, the key things to take note here our faithful witness, firstborn among the dead, of the dead, and the ruler of the kings on earth. Firstly then, faithful witness. Far from leaving us, far from abandoning us, far from forgetting and forsaking us, Jesus, the risen Jesus, the resurrected Jesus, the exalted Jesus, is among his people, and Jesus is among us, firstly, as a faithful witness. And why faithful witness? Because if you go and examine Jesus' life, whatever you do not know about Jesus, he lived by every word of God. He trusted, he bet his life on God's word and God's will that took him to the crow cross for us. And so, being a faithful witness in an increasingly hostile world towards us, beginning with them in the first century, and John will highlight that Antipas, right? Jesus will highlight and John will write it down, was the faithful witness in the city of Pergamon. And we'll read more about it. And because of Jesus as the example of faithful witness par excellence, all of us beginning with Antipas can, must follow that path of faithfulness no matter how hard the choking. The background is important. Scholars debate as to when this was happening and when was the writing of Revelation. Some give it an earlier date. Under the Emperor Nero, who ruled between 54 to 68 um, AD. And under Nero, we call him the Mad Emperor. The Roman Empire had begun to collapse and began to collapse economically, politically, militarily. And in collapsing, and this is the lesson we must learn. Whenever empires collapse, they would find scapegoats and bogey boys to blame for the collapse and the changing of empires. During this time of persecution, Paul, the apostle Paul and Peter were martyred cruelly. And then Jerusalem fell in AD 70, 67 to 70. But I think a more likely date of John receiving this revelation was during the reign of Emperor Domitian, who ruled from AD 81 to 96. And so, please picture this. The empire was tinkering. It was about to collapse, step by step, slowly. 
And then you have increasingly egotistical and narcissistic emperors like Nero and Domitian. They said of Domitian that either himself or the, his supporters gave him the title Dominius et Deus Noster. And you say, what on earth is that? They gave him the title Lord and God and ascribed to him because the worship of the empress, treating them as divine, was something they imposed across the whole empire. And so the main point, the main point is this, that there will come fake claims to divinity, and we must be able to discern and stand strong and say we will worship no one else but Jesus as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And so it was the fourth, in the 4th century, the historian Eusebius maintained that Jews and Christians were heavily persecuted during the end, at the end of Domitian's reign. So in all likelihood, this was written towards the mid to late 90s. Firstborn from among the dead, Jesus is the only one who died and came back from the dead. And then it's going to be repeated in verse 18, I died and behold, I'm alive again. And because of this, he starts a whole new human race where death is no longer God's rightful punishment for our sin and our rebellion against him. Death. I died, and behold, I'm alive again. There is only one person in the whole universe, in all history, in all time, who can make that claim is the person of Jesus Christ. Death. Let me just slow it down and ask you, have you thought about death lately? And you should say in honesty, yes, or else why is three quarters of the world in shutdown, shut in mode? Because we are so afraid of this unseen virus which might infect us. No, we're not afraid that it might infect us. We are infected with so many things. It, we are so afraid it might infect us, it might kill us. And so God's Word tells us that all of us fear death. We are enslaved by the fear of death. If you are listening and you are saying to yourself, in a very weird season of your life, in a very poor mental state of your life, I don't care about death. I am not fearful about death. And if you say that without faith in Jesus Christ, you are totally deluded. And I want to challenge you that when you find your sanity, you find some peace and some humility, you do fear death. We all fear death. Or else three quarters of the world will not be in lockdown because of an unseen virus, because we are so fearful of catching it and dying from it, which tells you here is the message. Unless we see Jesus' death clearly, unless we grasp Jesus' death, the meaning of his death, that's not for himself but for us to be made right with God, unless we see Jesus' death clearly, we will never live fully. And that's the message that God and Jesus through the angel to John is telling his people, keep looking at my death, the meaning of it for you. I died and behold, I'm alive again. Do you see Jesus' death clearly? Because without that, you're not going to see your life fully and live it fully. And then ruler of the kings of the earth, all empires and all emperors, all nations will rise and fall. Emperor, the Nero's will come, the Domitians will come. They are all the human faces of Satan's rule. So how does Satan rule and reign? How does Satan dominate the world? In the words of one writer, he says this, Satan pretends to be God. He usurps the place of God. And Satan's domination of the world's thinking is domination by imitation imitating the omniscience of God, imitating the omnipresence of God, and then we misdirect our love and our loyalty to Him. And so how does Satan imitate God? He imitates God by the human faces of politics, of economics, of religion, right? 
And so the spirit of the Antichrist is anyone or anything that claims and demands that we believe in that person or that empire or that government and believes that, that it is this government and this person that brings peace, that, that solves all our problems, our political problems, our medical problems. And I'm told if you go to North Korea, that's what they are told. That's what they are brainwashed. In any totalitarian society, that if you are healed in any way, you praise, you praise the great ruler Kim. All those things are manifestations of Satan's domination by imitation. And so, I can breathe is actually the church's cry against Satan and his cronies and his allies. Satan's knee has been on the necks of the church through time. And four main ways we're going to learn that Satan comes against us. By physical persecution. If he cannot get us by physical pers persecution, which is strike fear in us, he will get us by moral seduction. Moral seduction, mainly by sexual seduction. If he can't get us by those two things, he will get us by doctrinal confusion. Confusion. Confusing us that could it be this doctrine is true, could it be that doctrine is true, and shift our focus from Christ in Christ alone. If he can't get us in the first three, he will get us to divide against each other. Please take note what is happening in America. It is tinkering on racial collapse, economic problems, and losing its political supremacy in the world in the last 70 years under God's hand. Satan's knee has always been our necks through political persecution, seduction, cultural seduction, doctrinal confusion, and last but not least, in dividing us. And so, we must pray to discern and expose and repent of being seduced by Satan and his ways. Not simply to oppose Satan, but actually to exalt Jesus whenever the knee is on us. And we cannot breathe. We cannot breathe. So can you tell that in your daily life that you either listen to the voice of Jesus speak to you about the way you think, about the way you speak, about the way you live? And so, um, how many of you cope with lizards well? How many of you like lizards? Here in Asia, Southeast Asia, we have two main pests, cockroaches, and what we call house lizards. Right? And uh, in some, the technical, the geckos. And so I put out a, a trap to trap the lizard, and I put it under the microwave. And uh, I had long forgotten about it. Then one morning, Mona, my wife, came down and she saw that the lizard uh, trap, which was a glue, had come out from underneath the, under, uh, the microwave. And she saw, we saw two lizards there. And the two lizards looked like this. I hope I got it right. Can you see? On the right-hand side was a lizard. It is really brown out, burned out, which means it was trapped there for weeks on end. And as we turn on the microwave, it must have been electrocuted. And then was the new lizard that had just been trapped, most obviously the night before. And because it was still trying to wriggle out of that glue, it wriggled, wriggled, and the whole mat moved. And then if it hadn't moved, we didn't notice that, hey, we actually put this out to get rid of the dangers in our household, the, the enemies in our household, the pests in our household. But sometimes, you see, we don't take the dangers in our lives seriously. We don't take the dangers in our lives seriously that from day to day, we either listen to God's voice speak to us in His Word, in His Son, or we're listening to Satan's voice speak to us through the world and through our fallenness. And friends, when we don't take the effort to be prayerful and discerning, we may be trapped. And so half of America is in uproar because President Trump went to stand in front of a church, the Church of the Presidents, they call it, in Washington, and held out his Bible 
and they said he held out the Bible upside down. The question being asked by those who oppose him is, he held out the Bible as a symbol that he was a Christian. He is a Christian. But they ask, I think quite validly, we wonder whether he opens it. We wonder whether he reads it. We must wonder whether he keeps it. Because in the words of his former Defence Secretary, General Matisse, who has come out and spoken against him, he has never worked under a president who spends his entire life day by day bringing division among his people. Presidents are to be commanders-in-chief in unity, in concord, but his commander-in-chief in discord. And so can we discern? I, had, I have no idea. But that's what Christians at that time, 2,000 years ago, had to discern. Who do we bow the knee to? This Caesar, this Caesar, or do we bow the knee to King Jesus through all the politics and the economics, through all the circumstances we are going through? And so, on the personal level and on the macro level, the need to know that Jesus has been enthroned as King over all earthly kings. To Him and Him alone we bow the knee and the need to know that, Jesus, uh, that Satan that Satan dominates us by imitating the powers of God in creating a utopia here on earth. The next things we need to realise is this. It says that Jesus has loved us, freed us, and made us to be a kingdom and priests. So actually, when you read the verses carefully, you wouldn't find, it finishes by, he's the the king of all the rulers, and then immediately he, 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 he loves us. Kings and loving us don't usually go together because power and love don't usually go together. Jesus loves us. The ultimate purest reason for Jesus coming to obey God the Father and save us is we have a king who loves us. And we don't expect to find this just after we read that he's the ruler of the kings of this earth. Because power and love don't usually go together. And so, we have Jesus loving us. That's why a song we must sing at all times, but must sing even more now, in the anxiety of this pandemic, is whatever happens, we mustn't allow our circumstances to lord over us. We must allow Jesus in the midst of our circumstances to lord over the circumstances. And may we sing, Jesus loves me, this I know. Jesus loves me, this I know. You know, Jesus in the midst of his encircled church, his suffering church, his persecuted church, his choking church that cannot breathe in different times, he is not just amongst us, in his earthly life, he was amongst us as the suffering Christ. But now as the risen Christ, he's amongst us as the glorious Messiah. And so, no matter how bad our circumstances, we must believe because Jesus is amongst us as the glorious, mighty Messiah. We can overcome every persecution. We can tell every seduction and repel it. So Jesus is God's forever king among his people. And notice, this portion ends with, who was, who is, who is to come. We read the final bits. And then I turn to see the voice. Usually we turn to see a person. But he turns to hear the voice that was speaking to me. And on turning, I saw the seven golden lampstands. And in the midst of the lampstands, one like a son of man, clothed with long robe and a golden sash around his chest. The hairs of his head were white, like wool, like snow. His eyes were like flame of fire. The key thing to note is the Son of Man, that we begin our time together. And that comes from Daniel chapter 7 when you read the whole chapter, but the verses that are really key 
is that here is this human divine figure and he walks up to God called the Ancient of Days. And when a human figure walks into the presence of the Holy God, we expect what? When you walk up to your wife, what do you expect? When you walk up to your husband, what do you expect? When you walk up to your father, what do you expect? When you walk up to your bosses, what do you expect? You might expect retrenchment or lower income. When we as sinners walk up to a holy God called the Ancient of Days in Daniel chapter 7, we expect to be zapped in His very presence. But this human divine figure is give, actually given authority and glory and power over all nations forever and ever. And so this is fulfilled in the person of and work of Jesus. He is that Son of Man that Daniel speaks about. And everything in here has an Old Testament background, long rope, golden sash, could be a royal symbol, could be a priestly symbol. The hairs of his head were white like wool, and so all those with grey hair and white hair like mine, please take note, right, like wool. It's a symbol of wisdom that comes from God, the wisdom to judge justly. And what's so important about judging justly? Just ask the Afro-Americans in, in America now. Justice, after 400 years of the original sin of slavery, justice, because they are still facing injustice in the legal system, in the policing system, his eyes were like a flame of fire, so he sees all that is happening in the world. He sees all that Satan is doing, and he sees how his people is responding. So every single thing here is both comfort and assurance. His feet like burnished bronze, refined in a furnace. His strength, his voice was like the roar of many waters. And his right hand, he had the seven stars. From his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword. And so God's word judges the world, saves his people. A two-pronged action. And so, what's the meaning of this as we end? When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead, but he laid his right hand on me, saying, Fear not, I am the first and the last, the living one. I died, and behold, I am alive forever. I have the keys of death and Hades. Write therefore the things that you have seen, those that are, those that are to take place after this. This is what we said earlier. At the heart of this revelation, Far from Jesus being absent from his people, he's now present with us, but he's now present not simply as the suffering Christ, but the glorious Christ, who is King of kings and Lord of lords, even as his people suffer temporary persecution in this world. And the key to it all is, unless we see Jesus' death clearly, we will never live fully and lay down our lives for him. And so, Jesus absent from his people, far from it. He's physically absent, but he's spiritually with us by his Spirit, spoken about as the seven spirits in the seven lampstands, the seven churches. He is with us. And John, as he sees this, the Apostle John, he's on the island of Patmos. They say the island of Patmos is about 62 square kilometers. Maybe it's just slightly bigger than, than Singapore here. He's, he's a political prisoner there. Is a forsaken island with not much going on except for some boat repairs. And then John says of himself in the earlier verses before this that he's a fellow, he's a fellow brother, he's a fellow partner in the tribulations, he's a fellow sufferer, and he's a fellow endurer. And you say, fellow prisoner, fellow brother, fellow partner, fellow sufferer, fellow endurer. Sounds like Jesus, sounds like the Master, sounds like John, and must sound like us. Like Master, like servant, like Saviour, like safe. And John writes this down, that as true Christians, we mustn't misunderstand that the temporary physical absence of Jesus does not mean He has forgotten us, He has abandoned us. In fact, 
we should hold him out as the three things, the faithful witness, the firstborn that came back from the dead, and he's the ruler of the kings of this earth. And so as true Christians, we must, must get used to what? We must get used to the supremacy of Jesus in all things. He is now the Alpha and Omega, who was, who is, and who is to come. And so we must get used to Jesus' presence with us. We must get used to ACS forever, His authority over us forever, His centrality in all things, and His, His supremacy in all things. And this will be the message through the book of Revelation and into Colossians. Jesus, His authority over all things, His centrality that this COVID-19 is going to come and go and empires will rise and fall and it is Him who is supreme. You believe that? Sovereignty over God, sovereignty of Jesus over all things. And so, when this broke out, we were preaching through the book of Genesis. And then after we preached through the book of Genesis, we went to study the book of Matthew. We chose these books two, three years ago because our preaching program. And guess what? Here's a message I got. Dear Pastor Chris, my name is E. I've been a member of ARPC since 2018. And thank you for faithfully ministering to us during these difficult times. We truly appreciate the constant voice, the clear structure and continuous sermons throughout the series of Genesis. The online services have been a blessing not only to our congregation, but people everywhere. One of them is my boyfriend, who is a doctor working on the front lines, the front lines of the church in, in the UK, unable to attend church physically. But the sermons from Genesis have been a great source of encouragement and strength for us. So please, we thank you and pray for God's continued protection and guidance for you and the pastoral team and look forward to hearing God's word and meeting again. Did we know that this will break out? And here we are choosing a revelation to speak God's word to us, God's sovereignty. And so, by God's, in God's sovereignty, in Jesus' sovereignty, right, we're going to have this virtual camp. And the virtual camp came to mind one day. I was praying, I was praying. So, Lord, should we have the camp? We know we can't, we can't have the physical camp anymore. And then one of our doctors is on the front line. He just sent me a message. He says, you know, so many of us are on the front line and we really need the feeding from God's Word. Maybe you should, you should think of a virtual camp. And guess what? I was just praying about the need for a virtual camp that very week, that very morning, as he sent me that message. Nothing is outside the sovereignty of Jesus. You believe that? And so what have we been doing? A small group of us have been asked because of all that we have done with Let's Carnival, President's Challenge, and Bishan CC has asked, and a group of us led by Deacon Siu San has led that work in just providing meals for the Bishan Shunfu area. God's sovereignty in opening up that door. Years ago, we didn't know when we were going, they were asking, why do we want to go there? Some people, even amongst our midst, and Pastor Chris is giving too much time, just, just uh, extending that work and spending too much time there five, six years ago. Friends, the sovereignty of God. Last year, we took part in the celebration of hope. In the celebration of hope, we, by God's grace, 200 churches took, took part and they had a surplus of funds and they were praying, what should we do with the surplus of funds? And they said, Maybe we should give this surplus of funds to this new work, this new NGO, an aggregator, a networking, an AGWO, Allied Gospel Workers Outreach, reaching out to them. And so that work was started last year. Started last year and this year the pandemic hits and one of the main NGOs going out to reach is AGWO. Would we have known when we celebrated the celebration of hope, had this surplus of funds, that AGWO would be so used by God? I was speaking to one of the guest workers and he was saying to me, when this broke up, they were all so worried. All they knew is that they couldn't come out. They might lose their jobs. They were worried, worried for themselves, worried for their jobs, worried they'll be sent back, worried for their families, no more money. And then came, came this pastor 
and offered help and offered hope. And in his words, right, so new in his broken English, like magic, like magic. Of course, all of us speaking to him said to him, it's not magic, it is Jesus, the sovereignty of Jesus. Please believe that even as we face these very difficult circumstances, that Jesus is Alpha and Omega. God has given him all authority. He is the centre of all things and supreme. And no matter what you go through, you can call out to him because Jesus loves us. This I know. We're now going to sing this closing song. There is a higher throne. Closing, let us sing, There is a higher throne. Let us turn to God in prayer. We live in troubled times. And so often when we live in troubled times, we do ask in our hearts, honestly, have you left us? Have you left us behind? Have you abandoned us? Have you forgotten us? Have you forsaken us? As we feel the pressure encircle us and so often we cannot breathe from the persecution we cannot breathe because of the lies of satan telling us bringing about hardship and giving us false hopes grant us as lord as your people to see 
that in the midst of a suffering church in a fallen world, you stand among us as the glorious risen Christ and you are purifying us and you are empowering us for all that we need to finish this race, to be your witnesses as you call the nations to come to salvation. So we pray that in listening to your word, we will keep it and we will bet our life on you. In Jesus' mighty name we pray, always for your glory. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much for joining us in our services and pray that you sign up for our church camp, our members and our regulars, especially for the small group sessions. Tune in for our virtual church camp as we listen to God's word speak to us. The Lord bless you and keep you. We'll continue to minister to you on our virtual platforms to pray for you, to know you, to journey with you. The Lord bless you and keep you. Jesus is Lord.